Hello and welcome to Spy Hearts Podcast, where your hosts go deep undercover into the world of spy movies to decipher which films make the knock list. I am your host, Agent Scott, and joining me at the news desk this week, he is the purveyor of all things espionage entertainment. He decodes more films than the Noclus has ever seen in its entire life. His big, red, throbbing laser gives us a big O every week. It is the man, the cam, the provocateur. How are you doing, sir? Take off your pants. I knew you would do the take off your pants. (laughs) How can you not, right? You watch this movie and you're like looking for a it's, line. It's number one with a bullet. It's underlined. Yeah, that is number one, double underlined. And I think someone on Letterboxd even said, this movie features uh, Dana Andrews not wearing pants, telling other people to take off their <laughs> pants. That, that's a soundbite. That should probably be the intro for the episode. Just just have him saying, take off your pants. <laughs> yeah, because it's just like, I think that was the whole letterbox review. That's all they wrote, and they gave it like four stars. Uh, maybe that should be our review. <laughs> Take off your pants. Four stars. Take off your pants. Knock list indeed. Well, before we get to that, today's top story on Spy Hards. Spy Hards Die Hards. Are they a dying breed? Hmm. Well, let's throw this one to my co host, Cam. Cam, what is a Spy Hards Die Hard? Yes, a Spy Hard's Die Hard is someone who leaves a review for us on Apple Podcasts, and then we read that review on the air, as you know, this is a very formal broadcast today, and we read that review and then give you your special Spy Hard's Die Hard's nickname. Well, I'm telling you here on this show that the Spy Hard's Die Hard are not a dying breed. They are the best. They're the Spy Hard's of the Die Hard's, and joining this esteemed lineup of Spy Hards, Die Hards, this team. I've raided the vault of Spy Hards five-star reviews to bring back a, actual, a previous guest on the show who left us a review many years ago, and that is M from Verbal Diorama. Ah, okay. Okay, very nice. And, you know, she is a witty lady. Mm. We know that. She's been on the show. She's shared that wit, and it's very much in this five-star review. So here we go. I spy with my little eye a really great new podcast beware of imposters these spies are the real deal suave stylish sophisticated and stealthy with a delightful debonair discussion of the spy movie genre for scott and cam it's mission possible tucks up grab a martini and make sure you listen otherwise there's a chance this podcast might self-destruct for legal reasons this podcast will not self-destruct or will it Better listen and find out. Mm, very nice. Thank you, M, for those very kind words. And this one is a little tougher to draw a cool code name from. So I'm going to take a page from kind of like the world of um, Ben Affleck films. Is that a world? It is a world. I'm thinking of the movie The Accountant. Badass job, but like the title is kind of mundane, so you can hide it, right? Like, mm-hmm. he's the accountant. What, what, do you, what really can he do? But secretly... Top secret agent. So I'm going to give M the code name Stamp Collector. That could go down as the greatest Spy Hards Die Hards title of all time or the worst. Right? It's like no one looks at the Stamp Collector. They go, oh, don't worry about it. You know, M's just a Stamp Collector. But behind the scenes, pulling all the strings, pulling off all the missions, badass. Well, there you go, folks. You too could be a stamp collector, much like M from Verbal Diorama, if you leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. But uh, I think it's time we get to the main story. All right, Cam, that's enough of that playing around as news anchors. But I guess the question really is, why are we pretending to be news anchors? Because we are tackling 1942's Berlin Correspondent, not to be confused with Alfred Hitchcock's Foreign Correspondent, a far more popular film that people are probably hoping we would be tackling, and we will in the future. But Berlin Correspondent is starring Dana Andrews and Virginia Gilmore. Ironically, when I was watching this on YouTube, and yes, folks, it's on YouTube for free, and it's a very good copy too. Yeah. Immediately when it finished playing, it switched to Foreign Correspondent. Right, like Foreign Correspondent is the movie with the uh, reputation. It's in the Criterion Collection, mm. considered one of uh, Hitchcock's, you know, more superior espionage films. So, you know, this one kind of uh, piggybacks on that one a little bit, I think. 
Did it come first? I don't. They're right around the same point in time. Um, I think Berlin might have actually been before, but I may be wrong. These directors should have uh, corresponded with each other. Yeah, perhaps they should have. Cam just no no sold that joke there. That was a great gag. Oh my god. Well, you had me questioning in my head, like, was foreign correspondent earlier? And actually, it was. I just looked it up. It was 1940. I see, I see, I see. Well, if you haven't heard of Berlin Correspondent, and frankly, who hasn't, here is (laughs) your letterbox.com synopsis. And I warn you, this has a dot, dot, dot more. That's interesting. Okay. Crazy for a film that's 70 minutes long. It's crazy, though. When we tackle these old movies on Spy Hards, like, when it comes to the synopsis, it's interesting how many are just, like, spy goes on mission. And that's, like, your entire synopsis. And then others are, like, here is seven paragraphs giving you the plot of the entire film. And I think that is basically what happens here. And it's interesting, within the first sentence, there's a massive spoiler. Now, folks, this is a 70-minute film. I'm not going to say whether it's making the knock list yet. You can figure that out when you get to the end of the show. But, hey... This episode is going to be about 70 to 80 minutes. I would say just go and watch it because it's a 70 minute film anyway. And it's good quality. Yeah. 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 So there is a massive spoiler in here. So if you are actually thinking of watching Berlin Correspondent, this is actually probably one of the first times I've ever advised you to turn this off, watch it and come back because this will spoil it for you. Mm hmm. Yeah. Berlin Correspondent. He lived through a Nazi nightmare you'll never forget. Well, well. Dana Andrews plays Bill Roberts, an American radio commentator stationed in Berlin in the months before Pearl Harbor. There's your spoiler, folks. Having witnessed Nazi brutalities firsthand, Robert hopes to alert his listeners of impending dangers and does so by sending out coded messages during his broadcasts. The Gestapo begin to suspect something and assign glamorous secret agent Karen Howen, Virginia Gilmore, to spy on Roberts when she discovers that her own father, dot, 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 very mysterious ending there, Erwin Kaiser, is supplying Roberts with vital secrets. She turns her back on the Nazis and joins our hero in his efforts. That is, uh, yeah, a good Kind summation. of untrue. Well, I mean, it's, it's sort of true. But, like, I had a couple thoughts on this. Um, why is it a spoiler to say Pearl Harbor? Uh, because basically part of this whole story hangs on his immunity because he is a American citizen when they signed a, a non-aggression pact at this point in time. And at the beginning of the film, it tells you the exact date. Yeah. So, But at that point, Pearl Harbor had only just happened. No, it hadn't happened. It was 17 days away. No, no, no. I mean, as in like film viewers. Ah, gotcha. And I don't know the date of Pearl Harbor. December 7th. Thank you. But (laughs) I now know the date of Pearl Harbor. (laughs) Thank you. But what I mean is watching this film, I didn't know that date until like that happened. And then it's like, oh, because he has immunity until Pearl Harbor happens. The Japanese attack Pearl Harbor and America declares war on, you know, the Nazi uh, organization across the world and its allies. The Axis forces, basically. So I didn't see that coming. That's a twist. Right. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. Um, that one, to me, like, as soon as I saw the date, I was like, oh, okay. When I watched the movie. <laughs> that 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 might just be more of a North American thing or people who Could are be. up in, like, on history. Like, it wasn't my biggest subject in school. I don't know the dates of everything. I know, like, the dates of World War II, but I couldn't tell you the important battles or anything like that. I wouldn't know the date of D-Day, for instance. Well, I think it's also the, just that Michael Bay's Pearl Harbor had a profound impact on my life. Right. And I pretty much watch it every week. And, and of course, uh, Big Jim McLean. Big Jim McLean as well. <laughs> How stands the union, Scott? <laughs> How stands it? It stands well, I think. <laughs> the other thought I had was the tagline. He lived through a Nazi nightmare you'll never forget. I'm like, that's a tagline you can only attach to this movie <laughs> mid-World War II. <laughs> Yeah, I don't think you could really throw that around now. I think the only person who could get away with that is maybe Quentin Tarantino. Even that would draw ire. Yeah, it would draw ire. But like uh, Dana Andrews, what he goes through in this movie, I think is pretty much a slap on the wrist compared to a lot of what was going on with the Nazis. (laughs) Yeah, it's a little bit of a skip of the dance compared to some other people. (laughs) 
Uh, I mean, it's practically like Hogan's Heroes. What a nightmare. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah. It's like an inconvenience for him. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a boo-boo on my leg. What a nightmare. I would say what her father goes through is more of a Nazi nightmare than what Dana Andrews goes through. I mean, there, there could be a big time gap between when he ends up in the camp at the end and escapes. It's true. It's true. But what we know of um, what they refer to in this movie as concentration camps, it's a little different here versus uh, what the reality was. Which is actually a really interesting point that maybe we can talk about briefly later on. But like, it, it does. this actually is a very interesting piece of film because it mm-hmm. captures what people thought was happening in concentration camps during World War II. It was only post-World War II where we've really got an indication of just how brutal those camps were. Yeah, and there's like a little bit of a hint as to some of the horrors going on in the movie. Um, but like, uh, they're kind of off to the sidelines. They're not yeah. widely acknowledged. And I think that's kind of interesting. Because they're not widely acknowledged. You Literally, right. that is it. They don't, people are, they hear rumors because the propaganda machine is in full force at this point. And this film is a propaganda machine in its own way. Oh, big time. But like, yeah, the, the propaganda machine is fully in force at this point. And so, of course, the Allies are saying that the camps are the worst thing in the world. And, of course, the Axis people are saying that Germany is blissful rays of sunshine. There's been no bombings for 10 <laughs> days. Everyone is loving life here in Berlin. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, so it, it, an interesting film. I'm, I'm looking forward to diving into it more. I would ask if you have any background in it, but I doubt it. Uh, I doubt you've ever come across this film before. No, I think I came across it when I was just looking for obscure movies to add to our master list, and it falls into the lineage of movies like um, British Spy, Foreign Agent, or what. There's all these different terms we have, like these kind of generic spy titles. Mm -hmm. And when I saw Berlin Correspondent, I was like, throw it on the list. And I'm sure if you ask me, like, you know, five, ten years down the road to like separate these movies in my head, it'll be very difficult. I'll always remember this one as the radio one. This one, to me, I think I will remember a bit, but like British Spy was like the Russian Revolution, and I'll remember that because it was quite confusing. Yeah. And what was the name of the one with the coal? It was all about uh, uh, coal uh, deals in the Spanish Civil War. It's something agent. Was it agent or was it like foreign something? I think it's something agent. Confidential agent. That's what it was. Yeah, I knew it was agent. Confidential agent. That that that's the the coal one. That's all I'll remember it for. But so th- there is some things here that make this film unique. It's not a complete cut and paste propaganda film, and there's certainly things to discuss. But what I really want to know is, how did this correspondent begin corresponding from Berlin? Well, as is often the case with um, propaganda B movies of this mm-hmm. era, the behind the scenes story isn't necessarily the richest, most well. Um, what? detailed and reported upon, you know, story. There's not a making of Berlin correspondent book available, self-published on Amazon. I think the Wikipedia page is just like, this movie exists and it came out, <laughs> you know. <laughs> there may have been these actors in the film. We're not sure we haven't seen it. <laughs> exactly. Yes. So I can tell you a little bit about the writers who put the original screenplay together. Please. So first up, you have Steve Fisher, who was a Michigan born writer and screenwriter. And so started off like doing novels and short stories and got his first film credit co-writing the 1938 crime drama nurse from brooklyn and his next kind of big notable thing was in 1941 his novel um, was adapted into 1941's i wake up screaming starring betty grable which is a film noir movie really good actually i recommend it to people if you haven't seen it kind of a little bit on the obscure side but not too hard to track down which is also your mantra very true yes and he had a movie that led into this movie, and it kind of ties nicely to it. It was another uh, propaganda film in 1942 called To the Shore of Tripoli, and it was about life at a marine training base in San Diego just before Pearl Harbor. And so he was very firmly in that era writing these you know, propaganda films that would be airing before your main feature in theaters. And so it makes kind of sense to jump from that to Berlin Correspondent. Sounds like a good setup. I mean... I do note that he has two films that have location-based plots. Uh, that's, mm-hmm. uh, I guess, a connectivity there? Yeah, and he followed up this movie, actually, with the 1943 Cary Grant film Destination Tokyo, which he got an Oscar nomination for. The trio! That's the right, The location yes. trio! But, like, this guy just 
bounced around B movies for mm-hmm. like his entire career. He wrote so many. Uh, the stuff that really jumped out though was he wrote the final Thin Man movie, Song of the Thin Man. He was one of the writers on that. And he also became a prolific TV writer later down the road. And he was bouncing between B movies and TV through decades. And he wrote one episode of the 1975 Matt Helm TV show. I'd forgotten that existed. Yeah, that's the one where I think Matt Helm is a private eye. I'm less interested in ever watching that, I have to say. Uh, For those who don't know, folks, on the Patreon, we watch spy TV shows. We've done a few so far. I think we've got Slow Horses coming up soon as well, the first season of that. Something to look forward to. And if you're thinking about joining us, check it out on patreon.com slash spyhards. But a Matt Helm TV show where he's not a spy, it doesn't really spark joy. Well, when I was looking for obscure ideas to follow up the triumph of Nick Fury, Agent of S.H.I.E.L.D., I was actually looking for that Matt Helm pilot for us to cover on the show. Mm. And because I couldn't find it, that's how I wound up with Remo Williams, The Prophecy. I mean, I think think that Remo Williams episode actually lost us patrons. So (laughs) I'm not sure I can endorse more of that. They did not appreciate Sinanju on the Patreon feed. (laughs) None of them are masters of Sinanju. Uh, Fair enough. The other writer, Jack Andrews, who was born in Pennsylvania... Started out with a 1937 crime film called Born Reckless, which was about taxi cab corruption. So right there, this is a crime B movie, right? Like it's yeah. an hour long and sounds like something I would totally watch. I believe it is on YouTube, uh, so I might actually watch it. Um, That's Cam's evening sorted. <laughs> and again, this is a B movie guy. So he wrote like three or four of them. And then this was his follow up to the 1941 rom-com Marry the Boss's Daughter. But he only really worked in Hollywood for about 20 years total. Um, And it was all in B-movies. His final credit was with a uh, jewel hunt thriller called Hot Money Girl, a.k.a. The Treasure of San Teresa. And then he moved to Italy and wrote for Italian television for the remainder of his career. Well, that title was a bit of a mouthful. But hey-ho, I wouldn't mind retiring in Italy myself. Well, the a.k.a. is because it had different titles, as today's movie does as well. I didn't know that. I thought it was all Berlin correspondent. No, it had a couple other options. So, so often the okay. case... I'll check those options. It wouldn't surprise me if they put out The Treasure of San Teresa and people fell asleep reading that title. And then they were like, wait, change it to Hot Money Girl. <laughs> Everyone's favorite. I mean, who's not going to buy a ticket to Hot Money Girl? <laughs> well, Cam, I'm just checking out these alternate titles. And I think the ones you're referring to are actually just working titles i have to say i'm a big fan of everything is thunder so everything is is thunder is actually listed as an alternate title on imdb okay so i think they may have released it as that somewhere Uh, yeah but war story the other one i think that was just entirely a working title that got dropped it's as i mean that's so generic at least berlin correspondent has like a a a place like a location you can like focus on you kind of an idea of like a a tone, a sense of a feel, whereas War Story, you're like, well, that could be anything. And it might trick people into showing up to see Foreign Correspondent. <laughs> They're like, hey, mm. I, have, I never saw that movie the first time around. It's back in theaters. I better go. I, I wonder if I can spot Alfred Hitchcock in this one. Oh. <laughs> He's in oh. one of those prison cells. <laughs> <laughs> Minus five stars. He wasn't in the film. <laughs> so your writers are basically coming from the world of B-movies and uh, not too dissimilar to the director. The director is Eugene Ford, who uh, was born on Rhode Island and began his career primarily as a stage child actor. He was someone who was working at a very young age, you know, in vaudeville and things like that, doing stage shows. He has one movie credit where he acted as a child, and it was a 1916 drama called The Innocence of Lizette, which is about the friendship between an orphan and her landlady's nephew. And he just really did a one and done and then he just vanished pretty early into the 20s and probably was just growing up going to school but he came back in 1926 and began directing shorts with the occasional writing job on the side but the first feature film he saw he oversaw was 1928's daredevil's reward which was a tom mix western and for those who haven't heard of tom mix he was basically one of the original movie cowboys, uh, someone who was very influential to like John Wayne when he was shaping his career. And I believe John Wayne did meet Tom Mix and was uh, someone who I think he'd maybe done stunts on one of his movies at some point. But Tom Mix 
was like a big deal in B movie world. So people would be showing up to see Tom Mix Westerns and um, Eugene Ford directed like quite a few of them, like five or six of these of these films. Okay. I mean, I, I can completely buy that. These are all names I've never heard of before, but I, I assume Western fans would probably know who these people are. Yeah, the thing is, it's like you say Roy Rogers and people go, oh, I know that name. Tom Mix has not exactly stood the test of time as one that jumps to the forefront of people's minds when they think of Westerns. But People, uh, p- people don't talk about Mix a lot. <laughs> they used to call him Sir Mix a lot, actually. Mm, mm, mm. <laughs> He's the OG. <laughs> <laughs> I just wish I could remember what the Sir Mix a lot song was. I can make more jokes, but I've forgotten what that was. It's not, I like big butts, is it? You said it, Cam. Might be. Yes. I think it might be. Yes, I got him. <laughs> it is indeed. It is. Baby got back. Yeah, you you can't deny. Yeah, and apparently Tom Mix couldn't either. <laughs> 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 so, <laughs> segue from that to Eugene Ford. <laughs> um, <laughs> back to Nazis, Cam. Come on. <laughs> so Eugene Ford uh, directed like countless B movies. Most notably, he also in addition to a lot of Tom Mix films, did a lot of Charlie Chan films as well. And this was his follow-up to the 1942 boxing drama Right to the Heart. And he retired from directing uh about a decade after this movie in 1953, but uh lived until 86. Wow. So, uh I think this man was just like, I'm tired of this system. I've been cranking out B movies my entire life, and uh you know what? I'm taking 30 years to uh hang out in retirement. Hey, I hope he ended up somewhere sunny. So often in Hollywood, you just basically hear the story of like, well, they basically worked until they could not work anymore and then they died, right? Like, look at William mm-hmm. Shatner. That man is going to work until the day he, you know, drops off the face of the earth. I thought you were about to tell me some news I wasn't prepared for there. <laughs> no, no, of course not. Of course not. But like some people in Hollywood are so, you know, career focused and workaholics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all they know. It's all they know. Exactly. And it's interesting to see someone like Eugene Ford who was like, you know what? I think I've said all I have to say. See you later. I think I got it, folks. I'm out. Kind of like the other writer who was just like, you know what? I'm moving to Italy. I'm just going to do side jobs with Italian television. Which which reminds me, it's time to announce this is our last ever episode. See you later, folks. Uh, <laughs> we're, we're moving to Italy. We're becoming Italian correspondents. <laughs> we're going out on a high. We're talking about Berlin correspondent. <laughs> So, um, yeah, as you mentioned, the working titles, Everything is Thunder and War Story. I think... Everything is Thunder is pretty damn good. Should they have gone with that instead? Well, it doesn't make any sense. No, it doesn't. <laughs> it just It's a cool title. Like, if uh, if Bruce Springsteen had released an album called Everything is Thunder, I think everyone would be like, yeah, Springsteen! You could just, it's like a, it's a fist-pumping kind of title. Should Sir Mix-a-Lot have put out an album called <laughs> Everything is Thunder? And then, like, Thunder Butts or something like that? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Thunder Thighs. Oh, boom, you nailed it. <laughs> I am the new Sir mix and I'm British, so I can be a sir. That's right, you can. You can. <laughs> um, and so, uh, yeah, that's really kind of the behind the scenes on this one. There's just so few details. Wow, that was a short one. I like it. It is, yeah. And just basically what we were talking about up front, you know, this movie set 17 days before Pearl Harbor. So that was sort of uh, notable at the time as well. Uh, I think uh, reading the synopsis took longer than doing the behind the scenes right yeah that's the problem with these um you know propaganda films it's like it was just a machine cranking these things out so Mm -hmm. um i'm sure if you asked eugene ford about his experiences directing um berlin correspondent he would be like huh (laughs) i don't remember (laughs) i made seven movies that year (laughs) i like what butts yeah This is not the artist I expected to be associated with (laughs) in a uh, reflection on my career in life. (laughs) He's fine. He's fine, everyone. It's fine. Well, (laughs) uh, do you have any more for us, Cam? Of course, yeah. The top three for the year. Number one was Bambi. Number two was Mrs. Miniver, which was the Best Picture winner of that year, which is also a World War II drama. And number three, Yankee Doodle Dandy, which is a very patriotic musical starring James Cagney. Also a very good film, considered one of the great musicals of its era. I had one final note, and I was like, okay, when it comes to these movies, you don't get a lot of kind of juicy nuggets. You know, there's no like um, Razzie nominations or anything like that. It's kind of fun to kind of close it out. But this movie brought something up that I thought was kind of fun. A real obscurity bit of knowledge here. I like this. Come on, teasing. 
So footage from Berlin Correspondent was later used in the 1976 experimental film All This and World War II, which was a movie that was a kind of experimental mashing up of Beatles covers with World War II footage and film footage. Hmm. My question... Yes. ...at this early stage of you telling the story is what song was set to the footage of Berlin Correspondent? I don't know. I couldn't find it. I would have to watch the entire movie to track it down. But I can tell you they played I Am the Walrus over scenes of Pearl Harbor. So all this in World War II was sold as a musical mystery tour of the Second World War. And it featured um, artists such as Rod Stewart, Tina Turner, Peter Gabriel, Elton John, The Bee Gees, and Helen Reddy. And the movie was a total bomb, but the soundtrack sold like gangbusters. Everyone listening just now i don't think you're aware of this cam was really hoping you'd end that list of artists with sir mix a lot oh well and then it would have brought it all home everyone would have clapped and it would have been great now you well it would have but you are like a beatles nut this movie you're gonna YouTube. say you're a sir mix a lot i'm like <laughs> well, well, well well um this movie i is... do like big butts <laughs> this movie is on youtube for okay. free all right. Okay. Would you watch it as a Beatles like uh, you know, be, like Die Hard? Are you asking for a jokey answer or an honest answer? Honest answer. No. No, it doesn't interest you at all. It's kind of like this weird experimental thing. Straight shoot from the hip. No. I mean, I've watched some experimental films from that decade. I uh, the is it the Rolling Stones? The Pinball Wizard one. Oh, Tommy. Tommy. That's no. That's the Who. That's the Who. You're right. Sorry, British people. <laughs> I'm, I'm a Beatles guy. Keith Moon is very angry at you. His ghost uh, is going to haunt you. I'm sure. Uh, I watched that once and hated it. Is that Ken Russell? It is, yeah. I've actually never seen it. Yeah, hated it. Absolutely hated it. I just I don't like abstract to the point of insanity. Like I, I struggle with some David Lynch things sometimes and it gets so weird. And, that, and, and, and Tommy is pretty far out at times. I remember my mom wanted to show my sister and I Tommy at some point i have i don't know why it must have been something she enjoyed when she was younger but like my sister and i just saw the bit of footage of the guy spinning around on the pinball machine mm. and we were like we're not watching this <laughs> like that was it that was the deal breaker for us you made the right call you made yeah. the right call i i mean like i they've just just released the uh, the remastered version of the let it be film mm. on on apple tv plus Omega, Mega, whatever they call it. And uh, I have no interest in watching because I watched the original version of the film. Why would I watch it twice? Okay. Yeah, fair enough. I just thought this one sounded so bizarre, like unbelievably bizarre. Because it's like very like grueling footage of World War II with like, uh, you know, like poppy Beatles songs. If you want to watch a grueling Beatles film, just go and watch Give My Regards to Broad Street. That means something to people other than me. (laughs) People listening who like Paul McCartney and hate that film just fist pumped. Okay. Okay. That name recognition. It's a film he brought out in the eighties. He was trying to capture the spirit of the Beatles films. Him and Ringo Starr did it with Linda McCartney and Wings and some other people. I think Eric Clapton pops up. And it's just abysmal. It's it's horrible. Okay. It's kind of like uh like I watched all the Prince films and like Under mm. the Cherry Moon is like what am I even watching right now? I haven't seen it, but I know how weird Prince can be, or could yeah. be, and I understand. It's no Purple Rain, let's just say that. But uh, just the final bit I'll mention on all this in World War II. It features footage, as I said, from Berlin Correspondent, but also a few other spy movies we're going to tackle on the show in the future. None of the ones we've done before, but it features clips from Night Train to Munich, Casablanca, and 13 Rue Madeleine. Okay, those people have mentioned those two as before. I am aware of time, but I'm curious to ask you a quick question before we move on. As we don't know what scene was scored with what, hmm. what scene would you have put in the Beatles film and what Beatles song would you put to it? I'm still not a Beatles guy. All right, I, well, I am. So you pick the scene. Okay. And I'll pick the song. The scene. Well, it has to be something that represents World War II, right? Like, because this movie is about depicting world war ii so you're not gonna have a scene of like i don't know like uh dana andrews sitting at the news desk 
it's going to be something like I, I i even wonder if they just took the scene from like the planes bombing it could be something like that i mean i have a jokey answer sure what's okay what's the jokey answer you play the scene where he says take off your trousers yeah and then you cut to from the white album why don't we do it in the road you see that is why you are the one to answer that question and not me because i can only name probably like i don't know eight beatles songs it, this has gotten so like beatles nerdy now that only three people who like the beatles have got that but they enjoyed that joke i think you need to watch this movie and report back i don't i don't think so oh you've got the time <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. Well, okay, speaking of time, I'm conscious of it. Let's get to Berlin Correspondent. I want to know what you think about it, Cam, but I think I'm going to jump in first because you've been speaking for a while. Yeah. A part of me really wanted to like this film. It's light. It's throffy. It is very quick. 70 minutes. I love that. All good stuff. There's some enjoyable moments, some funny moments in this film. You wouldn't expect to see that in a World War II film. I can't take any of it seriously. No. It's it's insane. I mean it, it it's talking <laughs> about concentration camps and it's talking about, you know, the bombing of Pearl Harbor. And yet you've got take off your trousers. You've got like the most arch villain this side of Hugo Drax. <laughs> it I just I just I don't know what they were going for with the tone. Because this isn't like it's selling war bonds. It's playing the Nazis to be complete morons, right? And that and, and that is what the film is trying to say, which is, you know, fair enough. And and they're trying to they have an agenda in, you know, the war. It's a propaganda film, ultimately. But you can't take any of it seriously. Even that your hero feels like he's just walking through it with no stakes whatsoever. And and like he gets put in a camp and it immediately gets out of it. There is there is nothing heavy about this film. It is as light as it comes, but you can't have a tone where it's talking about things like concentration camps and Pearl Harbor, but also have the take your trousers off moment. Like it just it just doesn't mesh together. It was a very interesting movie because we've tackled a number of these um propaganda films and they are often misguided because they don't have the perspective of history to kind of understand what exactly they're saying. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean they aren't conveying like a severity to what is going on or why this is an important war and why America needs to get involved and what have you. Or the British get involved because we've watched both American and British propaganda films. Mm -hmm. This one, I had a fun time with it. It was a 70 minute just zip along caper that never flagged. It never felt like it was just chewing up screen time, which even 70 nope. mi uh, minute movies can sometimes. Mm -hmm. This one, you know, it had condensed plot. It was fun to follow along. I never quite knew where it was going to go. And it had some set pieces that were enjoyable. But it does feel like a movie that exists outside of time. Because as you said, like it is, I, I guess like I'm, I'm asking myself, what is it trying to convey to an audience? Because this is an audience that's going to the movies in 1942 there is that kind of dark cloud of World War II over them. Mm -hmm. They're seeing a movie like Mrs. Miniver, which is about a family surviving like the the just traumatic circumstances of living during the war. Sure. Things like that. Like it's movies like that that are giving them hope. What are they getting from Berlin Correspondent? I, the only thing I could really hone in on is that it, it is like making the Nazis look really dumb. So on one hand it's kind of like um you know diminishing them as you know human beings in the eyes of the american audience and saying like well they're just idiots mm -hmm. and we're gonna just trounce them so that i suppose is a morale booster in a way where they're playing it more comedically which isn't uncommon spielberg also was poking fun at the nazis all throughout raiders of the lost ark so i can kind of understand that as a way of kind of taking away their power but it was also like there's the scene where they're in the restaurant and um, the female lead, played by Virginia Gilmore, can't pay for her meal because she doesn't have her punch card. Mm -hmm. And um, Dana Andrews steps in and gets his punch, and he's the American. And they say, boy, it's the attitudes like yours that are going to win the war for America. So I'm like, okay, they're kind of underlining like the Dana Andrews character kind of represents the purity of the American spirit and what is ultimately the big threat towards Germany. Mm -hmm. But these are kind of like, 
isolated moments in a movie that is more plot based sort of character adventure. Well, it doesn't have time to hang out with people. It has to get from beat to beat to get to the end. Yeah. So really, it, it, every scene is about moving the plot along. Yeah. I, I don't think there's any any free space. Like I don't think you know anything about Dana Andrews' life. Or uh, Virginia Gilmore's, really. No. No, you, you know her job, her political affiliations. Mm -hmm. But that's about it, because these are fairly two-dimensional characters. I don't think anyone's particularly fleshed out. But I, I just, like... I just felt like from the get-go, there were no stakes in this drama, despite the fact that our hero ends up in a camp, like I said. Yeah. Like, he has immunity for the first 40 minutes of the film. Yeah. There's 30 minutes left at that point. He's put into a camp and then immediately told he can escape. And and then you fight for a moment. It's like, oh, maybe he won't. And it's like a trick. But at that point, your heroine's already on her way there to pick him up. And also, like the heroine... Part of the plot revolves around the fact her father, which I think, Scott, you mentioned in the synopsis, but her father has been smuggling secrets out of Germany mm -hmm. because he doesn't believe in the Nazi cause. And he's getting those secrets from his daughter who's working for the SS. And the thing is, is that the father sent away to an asylum, which that's where I said like some of the horror comes in because you're seeing in the prison cells, there's like a girl on with a crutch yeah. at one point and the, uh, the warden or whatever you call him who oversees the uh, the asylum, says, like, pretty soon we'll be 100% sane, this country, because we are exterminating these people. That's where I'm like, oh, they just hinted at something, but they never really come back to that? But I don't think they're interested in dealing with any of the gravity of these situations. But they also don't really know. This, this is, I think this is pitched as light. It is light, and it's like a moment like that kind of stands out because you go, oh, no, that actually is like honing in on something that is very much how we now look at the Nazis in retrospect. But maybe in that point in time, they're like, we think bad things are going on, but we don't know, so we'll just hint at it. Uh, I'm not 100% sure. We need a historian to really explain that to us. But moments like that stood out. But the reason I bring this scene up more so is because the father is in prison mm -hmm. or is in this asylum, and Dana Andrews has to go in to save him. And he does this by going undercover and putting on like a you know Nazi uniform and putting on this whole act. And his character feels invincible. And a caper like this feels like a movie. It doesn't feel like something that's trying to evoke what people would be feeling actually going through World War II. Like, this is very sure. Hollywood. And yeah. in that regard, it was fun. I enjoyed myself. But when you look back on this movie, <laughs> does it have any value now? I don't know that it does. Whereas, you know, you watch like Tonight We Raid Calais, which you can say from like a plotting perspective, maybe it is a little creaky it still has value in its visuals and what it's trying to say. Well, yeah, the, tonight we raid Calais had a message about, you know, stepping up and, and, you know, defending your country and doing the right thing. This is more just, well, it's a comedy. It's a comedy and there's a guy stuck in Berlin during World War II. Is it, is it just like American Daring Do and like kind of showing that? Yeah, it's like a pulp comic. Like this could be, a, uh, you could put this next to Dick Tracy. Mm, or Captain America, yeah. Yeah, I, I, and that's totally fine. I just feel like if you're going to do that sort of style of film, don't set it during a, one of the worst moments in history. Now, you didn't know that at the time. Obviously, in 1942, they didn't know how bad it was in some places. And it's kind of... And I think this is where the value of the film is for me. I mean, there are moments that were funny. I did laugh at this film. And I think people watching it would get some interesting bits out of it. But for me, it was more of an interesting take and look at what, the perception of the Nazi war machine was like during World War Two, mm -hmm. from the perspective of Los Angeles, right? Right. Like, I mean, different places in the world have different takes on it. I, I imagine uh, a, you know, a British comedy about Nazi Germany during 1942 probably wouldn't have happened, but maybe it did. But I, I think it would be far. It would be far less like broad, right? It'd be more satirical, I think. Yeah, and when you have like the villain played by uh, Martin Kozlek here, who's like the, uh, the the Nazi that our hero is bumping up against the whole movie, mm -hmm. he's portrayed as someone who is villainous, but like I almost feel like they give him more nuance than your lead. And I thought that was an interesting choice. Like he has a lot more going on. All of the female characters are kind of drawn to him. 
like there's a charisma to that character that I thought was interesting in that he's, as I said, like portrayed as the villain of the movie, make no mistake, but they also give him like a charm that I feel like they wouldn't later on. Maybe they lend, I mean, they do lend some stuff to him. He is given uh, a, a life. Yeah. A love life. Yeah. Or an attempted one at that. Oh, the women are falling over themselves for old Carl. They love a bit of Carl, uh, which is yeah, interesting. Not a choice you'd make now. But I mean, that's I mean, he was one of the things that really like surprised me because he's dumb. Like he he is played as uh, he's a Nazi. He's a commander. I don't know what his rank is. I don't know all the ranks. But like he he's pretty yeah. high up uh, in the Gestapo, I think. Mm-hmm. And this American runs rings around him. I mean, multiple characters run rings around him because <laughs> his secretary does as well. Yeah, that's true. Um. Well, let's get into the things that we liked about it before we sort of discuss and, and, and tear it apart anymore, because there are things I really quite liked. Me too. I, I think for me, number one is I love a 70 minute film that uses all 70 minutes. Mm -hmm. There is no waste. There is no fat on this meat, if you will. It's lean. It doesn't feel like Spy Ship, though where that movie was <laughs> like condensing two hours of story into one hour where like, yeah. you know, it was like smoke coming off the pen writing notes for that one. Uh -huh. This one was just expertly paced. It told its story and it knew how to move from section to section to section very efficiently. Like this is a just efficiently churned out um, World War II B movie. Yeah, it's it's by the numbers, but in a good way. Yeah, it's like totally watchable and enjoyable and features, you know, some decent stars. You know, Dana Andrews was, I guess, not at this point a reasonably big star, but he would go on to be one um, with movies like Laura and Best Years of Our Lives. But like he has movie star charisma. He's a leading man. You drop him in this. You surround him with other very capable actors and you send them on a fairly propulsive plot and it works. Yeah. I mean, it, I don't think B-movies... I mean, there certainly probably were some. I can't speak to all of them. But for me, they're, they're programming filler. They're meant to be like mm. light entertainment before the main feature. Now, I, I would say this is pretty empty calories of a film. There's not a lot of substance to this. But I don't think the assignment was for them to make a, a substantive film. I think that's the right word. Um, and so they made a, a light and frothy caper and I think if that was the assignment, which I think that is the assignment, I think they were pretty successful. Yeah, it just, it, you don't get any sort of uh, vibe of like, you know, the end of Tonight We Raid Calais, where it's like the women with the light coming down on them as the people they're going to sacrifice to help win the war. There's nothing like that. There's no symbolism here really ending the movie. No. There's no sense of like... There's nothing deeper. It's a romantic ending. Like it has honestly, like, uh, I'll just throw in like a little thing I liked, uh, but the ending is pretty perfect. You have your, you know, your couple heading off on the plane on an escape, and it has a little bit of a Casablanca-like ending, uh, in some ways. But like, they're on the plane, they're escaping, and there's some turbulence, and Dana Andrews' character drops his gun, and the uh, the Nazi who is driving the plane, who is being held hostage by them, mm -hmm. grabs the gun and picks it up, and then hands it back to Dana Andrews and says, "You dropped this." And Dana Andrews says, what, you want to leave Germany too? And he goes, confidentially, it'll be a pleasure. Wink, wink. Yeah, I'm like, that is like a perfect button on a movie. Mm -hmm. Like, if you're going to go to like, you know, the uh, nobody's perfect line from the end of uh, Some Like It Hot, which is perfect. This is a pretty perfect ending line for this movie. It's, it's a great moment to call out. And it actually reminds me of a film we covered a couple of months ago. Do you remember the chapter know what I'm talking about? Um, can you give me a little more than that? <laughs> that film I'm talking about had the bad ending of that airplane escape. Uh, it's not ringing a bell. Remind me, we watch so many things for this podcast. Allied. Okay. At the end of Allied, oh, Brad right. Pitt and Marion Cotillard go to the airport, try and steal a plane, and then it all goes to pop. Right. And they get the 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 British troopers get to them first before the plane can take off. So they're, they're a little bit quicker than the Nazis are in this film. And so that is sort of a negative ending, although there is a positive ending to the film. But it just it was quite funny, like the, the, the sort of uh, 
star-crossed lovers trying to escape on a plane. It's such a cliche of those types of movies where it's like, we need to get on a plane to escape. Mm. You know, Nazi territory and Casablanca probably does it better than just about any movie ever. And I would yeah. suspect Allied is also looking at Casablanca when they are uh, putting that together. Oh, I think absolutely is referencing things yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Um, another thing I wanted to bring up was I, I appreciate an unconventional spy story. Mm-hmm. We've seen a lot of the same stuff uh, repackaged in different shapes. This is a spy pretending to be a broadcaster. Um, yeah. Which is, well, no, he's not, he's not, he is a broadcaster and he is also a spy. And he's sending codes over his radio transmissions. It's just an interesting little spin. That was the kind of thing where I was making a note very quickly of, I've never seen this before. Yeah. You know, like someone who is, you know, a reporter in a war-torn area and has to send messages out through sensors and is doing it through coded language. I would have loved more about that because they, you know, reference that it's all winding up in the New York Chronicle and they are using some sort of code language. And to me, like, that is a really cool concept that that could be a whole other movie. Yeah. Just a movie about, like, a reporter operating out of, you know, Berlin in this case and how he makes this happen and how he's working with the sensors and how the sensors uh, themselves operate. Like you could make a more serious movie about this and I would totally watch it. But it was for here, just like a fun little bit of setup, but it was an effective one. Effective. And I think it also could very well be easily transposed into a modern story. You could Mm -hmm. do it about, I mean, podcasting theoretically or more like social media. I bet it's probably used. I mean, there are a lot of countries in the world that monitor or or stop people from using certain social media. Uh, Imagine someone was sending messages via Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, whatever. Friendster. Under, yeah, adult friend finder. (laughs) um, Under the guise of, you know, they're actually a spy for another country. They're trying to get messages out about what's going on. But because of, you know, propaganda in their country, they can't say that stuff. It's kind of cool. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it is. It's a really cool kernel of an idea that could have, I think, maybe inspired a better movie, like a more ambitious movie. Sure. But as just like a nugget of a novelty element here, I thought it was a lot of fun. And Dana Andrews, there's a certain squareness to him that I think works really well as like a reporter. I mean, I can't really fault that mustache too much. No, that is quite true. You could set your watch to that mustache. You absolutely could. But do you have any more likes for us, Cam? I actually really liked Mona Maris in this movie as the secretary. Carla. Who is in love with the Martin Coslet character. Mm, poor Carla. Yeah, like Carl, having Carla and Carl was an interesting choice. But anyways, um, mm. I thought this character was maybe the most interesting character in the movie because she has motivations. She has something of an inner life. And she is a real mover and shaker when it comes to the plot. And I thought Mona Maris was actually really interesting in this role in the way that, like, a lot of it is driven by she is in love with Carl. And she is a very good, like, guard dog. You know what I mean? Like, she Mm -hmm. is so good at sniffing out conspiracies going on around her. She is the brains in the room. And when you get to the end point, she sets up Carl because she can't have him. And she's like, you know what? I'm going to make sure this guy goes down. I'm going to help. Dana Andrews and Virginia Gilmore escape. And I don't know what happens with her career, but my suspicion is probably turns out decently for her within that party, at least for the short term. I don't know after the war, uh, old Carla, how that's going to turn out for you. But at that point in time, like she is someone who is almost like a Hans Landa kind of character where it's like, this is the smartest character in the room Mm -hmm. who is also something of a uh, social climber or a, uh, I guess, career climber who has those skills. And I thought the movie did a very good job in minimal screen time of making her feel like a compelling presence. Well, she was also very perceptive. She was able to see the bigger picture that was happening and, and and see past the obvious, like the, the, the the Nazi captain or commander or whatever he was, a person in charge that was so taken by love and vengeance that those were his leading impulses. She was a bit smarter. She took a step back and looked at the whole picture. She reminded me, of the mother character from Notorious. Yeah, that's a great call. Who warns Claude Rains, don't get involved with Ingrid Bergman. She's a no good lady. Uh, He still does it, and look where it gets them all. Yeah, it's like you can never really go wrong when you have a very smart villain. Mm -hmm. And Carl isn't necessarily the smartest villain. (laughs) He's, you know, a little dippy. Mm -hmm. But by having her in the room observing things... 
it does amplify the tension of scenes more so. And the fact that she's kind of an unstable element as well, where you don't quite know which direction she's going to go, I thought it did a pretty effective job of infusing a little bit of suspense into the movie because it's not a movie that is... um, This is not a masterpiece of suspense, but having a character like her and played so well does contribute quite a bit. Yeah, I agree. And I think the last like I wanted to add in was more just the small one. Uh, that's not uh, a comment on the guy's what he's hiding inside said trousers, yeah. but uh, the trouser gag you mentioned. Yeah, I, I just like the setup and the fact that he's going to do a hail Hitler and then drops his trousers. Right, and like he like goes to pick him up. There's a lot of physical comedy in this film. It, it, I mean, I think most of it comes from Dana Andrews. Mm-hmm. I think ninety five percent of it does. But he is a very good physical presence in this film, and you know you can set your watch to his mustache. Yes, but he also you know he, he's got a little bit of daring do to him. I actually really enjoyed that whole side mission at the asylum, like the way he has to dupe the uh, the lead doctor or mm-hmm. psychiatrist or whatever, and the way at a certain point where he's like getting the psychiatrist on board with him because he's like, well, if we uh like let on that this guy escaped we'll both be in trouble and the psychiatrist is like well i'll help you out then oh yeah uh, oh yeah 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 okay okay i'm on board i thought that was like kind of a fun little side mission in a movie that like these propaganda films can often feel a little samey mm-hmm. but like having an element like an asylum break in and escape does make it stand out a little more from the pack yeah and and those moments of like little bits of horror the interspersed in there like the lady in the cell like you mentioned or like the fact that they're just going to pretend to bury a body it's a burlap sack full of potatoes and it's it sounds so casual the way he suggested like it's something they've done before yeah there is a horror there inside of it not necessarily all intentional but upon you know revisiting or visiting for the first time many 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 moons later it's interesting and it does lead to a pretty good comedic beat where dana andrews is confronted by carl and they, you see two men drag something into the room and it's like built up and like, oh, what is this? What is this? And then they show it's just a bag of potatoes. I thought that was actually really effective. No, great delivery. And like the audience knew, but Dana Andrews didn't know. So he had to play it as completely like, wait, is this my friend? Yeah. It was great. Because you thought it was her father. Like yeah. they kind of set up that it could be her father they're bringing in. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, in no world would this ever actually happen. Like, no way they ever did this. They would have dug him up and then just arrested him and done the business. So this is all for the film's sake. But it, I think it adds a little moment of comedy. Yeah. And another moment of comedy, but also kind of, that was kind of badass, was when Dana Andrews, like, punches out Carl at the end of the movie when he's hiding behind the door. Mm. I was like, that was executed very well. Like, that was a really cool moment. And then you get the nice little bait and switch with having the uniform and pretending not to be the guy. And he ends up, they end up arresting the wrong guy. Yeah, mm-hmm. it, I mean, for a film, like I said at the beginning, that's dealing with such heavy themes, it does have these light moments that I, I think stick with me more than the heaviness. In terms of plot construction, it's solid. Solid as a spud. We interrupt this program to bring you a special report. Red alert, spy hards, we are shaking things up over on the Patreon page. That's right, we are launching an exclusive new show where we tackle the exploits of the small screen's greatest secret agents like Jack Bauer, George Smiley, and beyond. And don't forget, every month you also get two Agents in the Field episodes where we decode the adventures of your favorite spy actors in their biggest non-spy movies. But Cab, tell the people what we have coming up next. Well, Scott, we will be tackling another World War II film, albeit one with a very different tone. We are going to be looking at the 1977 Sam Peckinpah anti-war drama Cross of Iron, starring James Coburn. I wonder if they ever considered calling this one Cross of Flint. So strap on your Condor Man wings and soar into the future with us over at patreon.com slash spyhearts. But before Big O zaps us with a red pulsating laser, let's get back to the spy jinx. All right, well, coming back into it, Cam, we've already done a little bit of dishing the dirt on Berlin Correspondent, but let's dig a little deeper. I'm making potato jokes. Maybe I shouldn't. Uh, Dislikes, things you didn't like about the film. I'll lead us off with the incongruity of the comedy 
and the horror. Mm -hmm. I just commented on things I liked about both of them, but I don't think they ever mesh, which I think is a fool's errand to try and mesh those two tones. Right. I don't think anyone could pull that off. Uh, I think I mentioned Quentin Tarantino. I mean, Inglorious Bastards has both horror and comedy in it during World War II. That's actually probably the closest you can get to it, and that's a master director at work. Yeah, like um, I've seen like Kelly's Heroes, the Clint Eastwood movie. It's it's not a great film, but at least I think is more successful in kind of hitting the tone it's going for. Sure. Um, there are examples out there, but like this one, it, it's so tough to do something like this without the perspective mm -hmm. you know in the rear view mirror of knowing what you're kind of talking about sure like there's a line in this where carl uh says you know he's a prisoner of the reich he's being well treated and i'm like that line is very dark in retrospect mm -hmm. but at the time did they just like what were they thinking when they wrote that line in 1942 i think they're thinking that's what someone in nazi germany would say yeah now it plays more like a, tch -tch -psh, you know, like we waka waka, like we all know, like that's a lie. Yeah, it's like oh boy, oh boy. Yeah. yeah, yeah. The way that like they're kind of talking about concentration camps is pretty silly to watch now, and it's basically just them digging ditches. And like, there's the British guy that's like, "I'm out of here. <laughs> I'm not taking this anymore." Well, their version of a a concentration camp reminded me more of the prison from Cool Hand Luke. I was actually thinking the same thing. I was th not actually thinking that movie because I was thinking of an earlier uh, movie than Cool Hand Luke, but it's called I Was a Prisoner of a Chain Gang, mm. which very similar kind of uh, similar vibe as Cool Hand Luke, but a little bit of a darker movie. Okay. Yeah. But uh, even Cool Hand Luke has its dark moments too. Like again, th th there's a darkness to it, whereas this film just, just doesn't have that. And I don't... It, it, it it, weirdly, the subject matter is the darkness mm -hmm. in this film. The tone of this film is a comedy. I mean, when you have Dana Andrews just like, he has to make his escape and they're going to pull a, a switch on him. They're a literally pull a switch. They're going to actually turn on this electrified fence when he's on it. Like that's their plan. Mm -hmm. But he like scales up the uh, the tower, just knocks out the guard and then goes and jumps across the fence. It's done in a way that is almost like swashbuckling. Yeah. And it's made to look so easy. Yeah, it's like an old Errol Flynn movie. There's no sense of uh, of fear at all. No. No. No, there are no stakes in this film, despite it being where it was set. The most you get is the British uh, member of the concentration camp prisoner who makes an escape on the fence. I think that's the mm. rare moment of true like danger and death being yeah. shown. But I don't think that necessarily shows that he dies. It just shows he gets electrocuted and pulled off. Oh, I think he's dead. I got the impression he was dead. I think he's dead, but it doesn't say he's dead. Yeah. So, like, it is really down to the audience member to read into that. Totally. Yeah. And even when Dana Andrews escapes and his, you know, jacket's on fire, you don't have the real sense that, like, there was a hell of a chase for him to get away. It's like, it's no. kind of wacky stuff. It's him jumping in a car with the female lead, and you get, like, some kind of inept Nazis in pursuit. And at one point, there's a sidecar going completely out of control. <laughs> Off the rails! That stunt driver almost killed the guy in the sidecar. I mean, if you watch this film, just watch it for that moment. The The stunt driver driving the mo the motorcycle with a sidecar on it whips it round a bend. And the guy in the sidecar, obviously there's no seatbelts in the sidecar. He shoots out and comes, pulls himself back in with like his little Sten machine gun. Like, oh my God, I'm going to die. Uh, th that made me laugh to no end. I went back and rewatched that moment. But I also rewatched a moment just before. You've got uh, Virginia Gilmore driving the car to go and collect Dana Andrews from the camp. And they've obviously taken one big wide shot of the car going from left to right out of the frame from either end. But I don't think they could afford to shoot any more because it's all shot on film. Yeah. So they just replay that scene about seven times interspersed with him like doing stuff in the camp. And it really reminded me of the gag in Monty Python and the Holy Grail where Sir Lancelot's running at the castle. Uh, John Cleese is Sir Lancelot. And there's like two guards standing at the castle. I think uh, one of the Pythons is in the castle. Um, and they're just sort of eating an apple whilst watching him run towards them, mm. and they keep on re-eating the apple because they're just reusing the shot of him running, and it just like keeps on repeating the shots of, of of him running at a distance. And despite the amount of time it would have taken him to run that, the scene goes longer, so he's still continuously running at the screen, and that's kind of the joke, sort of Terry Gilliam editing thing there. But 
Like it just reminded me of that. It was not intentional, of course. They could have just played yakety sax over this entire chase at the end. <laughs> it's pretty. Is that the yeah. Yeah, yeah right yeah yeah absolutely it it would fit perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> and like that's kind of the the comic tone we're talking about where it's like it feels very like zippy and silly mm-hmm. yeah if there was a slide whistle in this film i wouldn't have been surprised it's interesting though we're talking about like how this movie doesn't have the horror element you might think there is one moment i thought was so strange where her father's been captured and is being tortured mm-hmm. and we get this like cut where it's the father kind of slumped in a chair and there's these two shirtless giant Nazis on either side of him with whips. And I'm like, oh, this is a very strange shot. Why are they shirtless? They were. They were, Yeah, they were both shirtless. And then they're like, he's not giving us anything. Proceed again. And like these two guys come around with whips again. And I'm like, this feels almost like it's from a Nazi exploitation like kink movie or something. Like what a weird kind of isolated move uh, moment in a movie that is by and large pretty Hollywood square. Maybe, uh, what's our director's name again? He had a, he retired to Italy. I forget his name now. Eugene Ford. Eugene Ford, uh, like to, uh, t- take in a few odd clubs in Los Angeles, perhaps. Did that moment jump out to you? I thought it was. I actually completely blanked on uh-huh. it. I'll have to go and track it down. But, uh, two sweaty, uh, Nazis whipping, uh, one of our, our spies is not what I want to hear. Yeah. Odd moment. It definitely jumped we'll out. We'll see. Yeah. It, it was. <laughs> I don't want either of those things. <laughs> it was. Because you would not watch this movie and think of its visual imagination. That's not really an no. element of, um, you know, Berlin Correspondent. But that one shot is like, huh, this is this is odd. I, I thought when you were saying about the torture, you were going to tie it into the comfy chair gag. But uh, no, there you go. Yeah. I thought you were Monty Pythoning it up. But uh, let's hear from you a dislike. Yeah, we haven't talked a lot about the Karen character played by Virginia Gilmore. This character. It's something I was going to come to. Yeah. Yeah. This character. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> First off, when they were recruiting her as a spy, uh, you know, or, or saying she's a spy because she wins over Dana Andrews in that restaurant. And then it cuts to her in the office and they're like, she succeeded where all else, all others have failed. And we've seen previously like some comedic bits of like Dana Andrews being trailed by a PI who's really inept and posing as like a blind man and things like that. You know, his mm-hmm. his kind of like uh sensor chaperones at the uh the um studio who are sent to the Russian front for failing. Yeah. And then we find out she succeeded and you're like, Okay, this is cool. We have a female spy. We've seen some effective uses of that type of character in these World War Two films. I was like making notes like this is a terrible spy movie if I'm to look at her as the spy that has landed this movie on our list of movies to cover because it's dropped almost immediately. She uh, basically, as soon as her father's kidnapped, is like, okay, I give up. And it turns into kind of that, uh, just that kind of like dippy romantic interest kind of role. Mm-hmm. I mean, she does have a moment at the end saving Dana Andrews from the camp. So there is that. But by and large, this character just feels very wishy-washy and their romance is not exactly crackling. Well, it's it's a thing because you, you get a sense very early on that she's sort of career-driven. And also driven by the ideological stance of Nazi Germany, right? Yeah. That she wants to work for to, towards that end. For the Reich, that sort of thing. But then, as soon as she meets a handsome American with a nice mustache, she immediately abandons all of her ideals just for this guy. Now, I'm not saying that Dana Andrews isn't an attractive fella, and he's got a smooth radio voice, but I don't, I don't know why you would set her up as this like, because there's a, there's an, there's an implication that in, in, and this is a true implication that in Nazi Germany, they would encourage young Germans to spy on their parents. Right. And it happened also in, in communist Russia. And I, I imagine it probably still happens now where they, they encourage them to spy on their parents and, and dob them in if they're doing anything that doesn't suit the party line or whatever. But once she ends up finding out that she's dobbed her own father in accidentally and she's fallen in love with this guy, her entire ideology just disappears. But then all of her like moral center goes too. Mm-hmm. So she no longer is interesting. She's just a one-dimensional character who happens to be in love with our protagonist. Yeah. And we know nothing about her. Like... If she has zero dedication to what the Nazis are doing, uh, then like, what else is there to this character other than she has a father? We know nothing mm. else. 
And does she accidentally like set up? Yeah. And the thing is, like, we've watched some other um propaganda films that these are not masterpieces of the form. No. But they had female spies that were interesting. And I think of um Spy Ship, yep. where it was the woman who was the aviator. And then I think of British Intelligence, which is even creakier than this movie. This movie actually looks like it cost a little bit of money. British Intelligence looks like it cost absolutely nothing. But that one had like a uh, a woman who was like a double agent. And the movie got too convoluted for its own good. But that character had like a presence and you understood what drove her. In terms of Karen, she feels like someone who just goes whichever way the wind is blowing. Yeah, which uh, is hard to make her a, not lead, but co-lead, because she doesn't stand for anything. Yeah, and she is top billing in this movie, so in theory, yeah. I should be really interested in her character's journey, but I don't think it makes any sense. No, I don't think it makes any sense either. And and she's played as dumb. Yeah. really. She makes some really silly choices throughout the film. Um, and it just you kind of watch her and you shake your head, and that's not what you want from your lead of the film. Well, she's presented as someone who is a capable spy, mm. um, although she does have misgivings about being a spy. But nonetheless, she's someone who seems capable. But then we find out like her father has been smuggling secrets that he's getting from her under her nose, no problem. Which which goes back to the whole like the the whole party is portrayed as idiots in this because the best of the best is that PI who's the worst. Yeah, and her who has missed her father like giving away secrets the entire time. And I feel like the PI, the censor guys, uh, even Carl are mm -hmm. presented as pretty dumb, intentionally so. Yep. I don't yep. think yep. the movie wants us to walk away thinking Karen is dumb. No, I don't think they do, but it we do. Yeah. Yeah, I think that I think she's meant to be like the smart one of the bunch cuz she jumps shit. Mm -hmm. I think that's maybe what they're trying to infer. Right. The other thing I wanted to mention, which is more of a nitpick, which will wrap me up for dislikes, is this film makes no effort to explain why Dana Andrews' character has immunity. I think it's because he's a member of the press. Um, like, he's an American press stationed there. Uh, no, I, I know why. Yeah. Because I understand how diplomatic immunity works diplomatic immunity <laughs> that didn't turn out so well for that guy it, it did not um but why is this guy getting gallivanting around doing whatever he wants like he's arrested at one point and immediately released despite the fact that he is still the cause of this entire investigation and it, it, it's like they never once go well that diplomatic community if, if those americans didn't have it we would have nailed him this time like that's a one little line you throw in and everyone goes oh right that's why okay because everyone has American accents in this anyway. It's really hard to delineate who is an American and who is a German. Yeah. Uh, so the, it's a small thing. It's a nitpick, like I said. It just feels like maybe that's part of the joke to an American audience is that like they've dropped this you know capable American character in the land of like goose-stepping uh, goose idiots. Mm -hmm. And look at how he's immune and he is just pulling off missions left, right, and center, making them look stupid. And there's nothing they can do to him because he is like... Join the war effort. You can be like this guy too. Exactly. Yes. That's that's the American daring do, you know, under pressure up against an enemy who is um, <laughs> not the brightest. Mm. Well, let's just go to final notes before we wrap this baby up. Uh, first one I wanted to mention. There is a character that is briefly mentioned in this film. It isn't his first time being mentioned in a 1940s spy film, although I couldn't think of the other example. But that is Hans Gruber. Yeah, we came across this before, didn't we? Yeah, and I, I looked through the, our archives and I couldn't find mention of where Hans Gruber was. Mm -hmm. But it is in a film we've watched before. And if you're listening to this and you know the other film, let us know on social media when I post about this episode. And so we can go back and find out because I want to connect the... Uh, Hans Gruber trilogy. Was Hans Gruber like a, at the time considered a very like generic German name to throw around? I think Hans was. I think Gruber less so. Right? Like it seems bizarre that Gr that's the, the thing I think as well. Like the Gruber is the weird part to always be popping up time mm. and time again. But uh, I don't know. There's got to be some sort of like um, <laughs> five minute YouTube video that could be made tracing the uh, Hans Grubers and how it wound up in Die Hard. 
yeah, I, I wonder what was the uh, the defining or, or the instigator for that character name in Die Hard. Yeah, it's, I mean, is it in the book? I don't know. I don't. Th- I think it is a different okay. name in the book, actually. Ah, okay. Hmm. Let us know, folks, if you happen to know where that name was inspired in Die Hard. I'd be interested to hear. I have one more note, and that was more a, a part of me wanted a dark ending for this film. Right. Like the Allied ending, where they don't make it. Sure. And they get caught, and it's all downhill. And I know that's not what this film was designed to have, but I think that would have been more interesting. I was okay with this. I mean, it's kind of uh, a... It's uh, pulpy, isn't it? it? It's a yeah. pulpy film. It, it's just kind of... Having fun, it is uh, just trying to be like an escapist World War II film, I suppose, showcasing a very resourceful hero. And uh, I think this was the appropriate ending. It was fine with me. That's fine. A- any notes from you? The only one I had was, it was more of a question, actually. So we find out that Dana Andrews, his contact, where he's getting or smuggling his information out, it's a uh, guy working in a stamp collection store. Mm. And I was going to ask you, if you were a spy, what kind of, you know, um, collectible store would you be trading your information in? Easy answer. Easy answer. Trains. Model trains. Model railways. Trains. Okay. So I was thinking you might say like Star Trek memorabilia, but you're going to say trains. There's actually train stores near me mm-hmm. like railway model railway stores although well, there is a star wars store very close to me yep actually maybe i should go with star wars because i i don't want to besmirch star trek by doing spy business inside of a star trek shop but i would besmirch star wars uh yeah for me i think i have two options because uh i do have a pretty sizable vintage star wars figure collection sure so i could walk in there and talk the talk you know i know about yak face amina man uh <laughs> you know han solo in carbonite i got those figures you know imperial dignitary oh i can speak it um so that one i could definitely fly under the radar but also if i'm going to a comic book shop silver surfer spider-man that's my game so for you, it's more about the lingo. That's what you want to be able to, to partake in. I want to be able to go in there and bury my code na- like my code terms in the language of the hobby that I am interested in, and I could do that mm. pretty seamlessly. See, that that might give me a hiccup for my train stuff because I, I do... That's actually my retirement thing is I want to get into model railways. Yeah. Once I've got more time on my hands, I'm going to build a big one like in the top of uh, the house in Beetlejuice. Hmm. That's what I'm going for. That's more of a model town than a railway. I think there is a railway on that set, though. I think there was, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I am right. I'm sticking to my guns on that one. Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice. Uh, so, yeah, that's what I'm going to go for. But I don't know if I know all the terminology now. Right. So I don't. maybe my answer would be... Maybe, maybe you do it out in the open. I talk about spy movies. Oh, okay, okay. Okay, I bury it in there because I'm already overtly talking about them. So I'd be stupid if I involved actual spying inside of these uh, spy movies. Or maybe the entire last 180 episodes or so have all been coded messages. <laughs> well, maybe we'll have to go back and re-listen to them and find out, figure out the code. Well, well there isn't one e- either way. Uh, yes, yeah, so that's my answer. <laughs> Okay, well, that settles that. So um, if you ever see espionage taking place in hobby stores, if it's a train store, it's Scott. If it's a uh, comic book store or Star Wars memorabilia store, it's me. Yeah, uh, what do you pick, folks? What would you, where would you conduct your spy business? Hmm. I think libraries would be quite fun. It's quiet. Yeah, I guess so. Probably a nice coffee shop in there. I need to be able to like trade in the language, though. Like, What am I saying? Am I saying books? Dewey Decimal System over and over again? Dewey Decimal System. It's a nice little phrase. It is indeed. Hmm. Well, much like that Nazi pilot, we're getting the hell out of here. Let's talk about knock list. Berlin correspondent Cam, is it making the list? No. No, 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 no. This is just like some B-movie, pulpy silliness that's enjoyable to watch, but this is not a knock list film. But I don't think anyone would be bored watching this movie. No. And I, 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 won't, I won't sort of hang around and talk about it for a load I think it, the exact same. I think there is some merit to this film. It's interesting. It's a 70-minute breezy watch. You won't regret it. But is it going on the list of the best spy movies of all time? No, this is just a classic Spy Hard special. Yeah, totally. It's like um something like Spy Ship. Yeah. Pulpy. Fun. Light. I think it has 25 reviews on Letterboxd. 
Let's see if we can get a few more in there, folks. There's your mission, folks. Should you choose to accept it, is to watch it, Berlin Correspondent being it, and leave a letterbox review and say the Spy Hard sent you. That's right. I think we did that in the past with, it might have been Spy Ship. Might have been. Uh, and so, yeah. something like that. Yeah, it was something along those lines. It might be Five Fingers, actually. Could be Five Fingers, but uh, either way. Yeah. yeah let's, uh, let's boost those reviews on Letterboxd. Yeah, absolutely. Well, there you go, folks. Two no's. Berlin Correspondent is not making the knock list. The dossier on the film is complete and filed as classified. But Cam, one last transmission. I need you to tell us what we're talking about next week. Scott, it's time to embrace that 70s grit again because we are going to be tackling the 1975 Sam Peckinpah thriller The Killer Elite starring James Caan and Robert Duvall. Do you like pessimism, folks? Because boy, do we have a massive dose heading your way next week on the show. You're going to hate the government by the end of it, and you're going to hate slow motion ninjas. Trust me on this one. But uh, it's definitely an interesting film, and it's my first adventure with Sam Peckinpah's directorial style, which I'm sure we'll uh, dive into in the episode. So your mission, folks, should you choose to accept it? And that's a big question. Is join us next week as we head back to the 1970s and take a look at Sam Peckinpah's The Killer Elite. And if you like what you heard on the show, please consider supporting us over on Patreon at patreon.com slash spyhards. A ton of bonus film reviews. Uh, basically, we do a show called Agents in the Field where we review some of the biggest films from the biggest spy actors, but not spy movies. So we get to sort of let our hair hang loose and talk about non-spy films over there on the show plus we also do on the small screen so spies on the small screen on the televisual medium tv movies and short run tv series uh, we've got a few on there so far but check it all out links in the show notes below make sure you follow us discreetly as always on social media at spy hards that's s-p-y-h-a-r-d-s on facebook twitter and instagram but until next time folks I've been Agent Scott. And I've been Cam the Provocateur. And uh-oh, here comes the Blitzkrieg. Mm-hmm.